a little after four, so we would like to start our writing webinar. So first and foremost, we would like to thank all of you for joining. This is our first ever educational services curriculum webinar, so we're very excited to present some great information with you. My name is Suzanne Wildy. I am a director of elementary education, and we have a great team here joining us today. We will be going over who's with us in just a minute. But again, we wanted to thank you for being here. The purpose of this webinar and the future ones is to really share about some of the great practices that we have in our district and inform you about some of the things that we're working on that we're really excited about. We do have a question and answer and Dr. Lee will go over some of the protocols for that when we get started, but thank you. And we have a fantastic team with us today. I'm going to introduce for our elementary team who we have, we have Ms. Gina Stetzel who is the principal of Dapple Gray. And we've got Dr. Salvatrice Kuykendall, the principal of Rancho Vista Elementary School. We have Michelle Marcus, who is a literacy instructional coach here. We have Christine Lloyd, the teacher at Dapple Gray, and Ms. Darlene Levine, who is a teacher at Rancho Vista. So we've got a lot of people here. And Dr. Lee, our director of secondary, is going to share about who we have on the secondary side. So happy afternoon, everyone, on a Thursday, um, on a Thursday in October. So today we have Carrie McMahon. I think she's trying to join us on Zoom right now. We got Olivia Okita from PVIS, Rachel Lopez Lavalle from Rich, uh, Ridgecrest, Sandy Sofnella from Peninsula, Leah Lewis from Palos Verdes High School, Becky Egan, Artosa for our teacher on special assignments, secondary instructional coach here at the district office, uh, Ms. Jen Egan, associate principal at PVIS. Mr. Danny Barbara, Associate Principal at Ridgecrest, and uh, Mr. Mancia, who will be joining us once Zoom cooperates and all. So thank you for joining us. So today, uh, this is our quick agenda. Uh, we will be talking about the district-wide PVP USD writing initiative. Um, and you'll be able to see what our program looks like all the way from kindergarten to 12th grade, what writing looks like in the elementary level with writer's workshop, how to help your writer at home and writing in grades six through 12, um, and what it looks like in the secondary level. And we'll also talk about next steps. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the Q&A section of the Zoom, and we will do our best to try to answer it at the end of our presentation today. And whatever questions that we don't get a chance to come around and respond to, we will put it in a document and also uh, link it to the video on, um, on, on our website. Great, thank you. So I am going to start right now with giving us a little bit of background about our writing initiative for kindergarten through fifth grade. So while writing is not anything that's new, the way that we've approached it has sometimes varied between school sites, between all of our 10 elementary sites. So one of the things that we felt was an important focus was to really align and have some consistency across all of our elementary schools. We also had some feedback from some of our educational partners that writing could use some extra support that we wanted to look at how we could make that happen. And so we are right now in phase one of a three-year rollout. So we do have a long-term plan and at three years, it won't stop, but the we will realign and make our next steps. So one of the things that we did was we hired a literacy instructional coach who you met and she'll speak later, Ms. Michelle Marcus. Um, we also have been starting with adding in more collaboration and planning time for our teachers. We have been having professional development from consultants. Recently, we've been working with Momentum and they have been doing some modeling in the classroom, some lessons in the class, and they've been observing teachers, providing feedback. And then we've been having teachers come to the district office where they're looking at writing samples and they're discussing how it's going and they're providing directions on some of the next steps for their students. So this is kind of just a little bit of a start of where we are. And Ms. Gina Stetzel is really going to share about what, what, is, what is Writer's Workshop. Thank you. Okay, so this, this uh, part of the presentation is just kind of a broad sort of look, approach at, you know, what is Writer's Workshop. Um, some of us have had training prior to this exploration and this new initiative that we're kind of pushing out in the district. I've been here for a while. We've done different versions of it. We've done some very direct instruction on it, but we were sort of everywhere. So we wanted to bring us all under the scope of writing workshop together as that, uh, at least we'll speak to the elementary part of that, that K-5 writing program. So the slide sort of presents some of those ideas. Again, these are kind of broad ideas. 
that it's approach to teaching writing, right? It's not a program. We're not getting these books and a box of all this curricular material that's being handed to the teacher. It's actually an approach. We're teaching the writer, you know, so it's very targeted specific to the child learning to write. Um, and then Mrs. Lloyd, one of the classroom teachers, she'll speak to that a little more specifically when it comes to her slide. We want to make sure that, ch that, that kids have choice in their writing. So a lot of that anxiety and that angst that can happen in writing is minimized. Um, and this approach to writing gives that uh, more relaxed, comfortable uh, stride into building that structure and the rigor in writing. It's part of our literacy program. It's not all of our literacy program, so it is an important part. Um, and then, you know, the the teacher that we teaching we're teaching the child specifically how they can build their writing structure. We're not trying to fit a program into the whole class to follow along. So I think this individualized approach into writing is really important to think through too as you're hearing the information today. Um, I'm going to pass the mic over to, to Mrs. Marcus and she'll break that apart even more. Thank you. So Gina just shared an overview of what Writer's Workshop is, and I'm just going to share some of the goals and the components of Writer's Workshop. So teachers in all grades, K-5, are going to teach four to six week units of study focusing on narrative, informational, or opinion-based writing. During a writing workshop lesson called a mini lesson, teachers will model using their own writing or published books that we call mentor texts to point out authors' structure and craft which students are then encouraged to use in their own writing. So when we talk about craft, we look at how writers make their writing stronger. And when we talk about structure, we look at how writers keep their writing focused and organized. For example, with informational writing, a teacher might point out in his or her own writing or in a mentor text that writers might group their writing into sections or parts or chapters. An example with narrative writing, a teacher might use a mentor text to show how writers use a strong lead or a hook in their writing. They might paint a picture showing what's happening instead of just telling what happens. Students' individual writing needs are met during conference times or check-ins, which are held individually or in small groups while the authors, the student writers, are writing. So the goals across all types of writing are that student writing makes sense, student writing is focused, the writing says enough so others can understand what the writer is saying, and that writers add or say more to make writing stronger during the revision stage of the writing process. So next, Christine Lloyd, our first grade teacher, is going to share what a writer's workshop block might actually look like in the classroom, what she'll take you through that. Hi, everyone. Um, so a daily schedule in a writer's workshop um, time uh, begins with a mini lesson. And this uh, amount of time depends on the grade level. So in a first grade classroom, we would maybe have a mini lesson lasting no more than six or seven minutes. Um, this is focusing on the teaching point, um, which is determined by the needs of the class. Students might gather on the floor and listen and watch um, modeling different um, concepts for the writing topic that we might be focusing on uh, once they go to their seat and uh, begin their independent writing time. So that next step might last between 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and this is where students go back to their seats in the independent writing time and they work independently. Um, teachers might also confer with individual students to help them um, you know, work on whatever area they have um, a need, whether it's struggling or even to encourage them like, oh, that's sounding really, really great. Let's let's um, keep going, like just encouraging them in this whole process. Then we move on to the mid workshop interruption, which is a very brief two minute or so um, uh, interruption where you uh, introduce maybe another teaching point. And this is something more spontaneous 
where it kind of comes from direct student work. So as you're walking around helping students, you might notice something that you want to share with the class and get the kids like interested in uh, maybe adding that into their writing or, you know, paying attention to that kind of um, topic as they're working on independent writing. And the final um, step in our schedule uh, is the teaching share, which is about five minutes at the end of the workshop time. And the teacher will um, get students' attention and point out how their stamina was during the writing process. At the beginning of you know, the school year, their stamina is usually much um, less time. And so as you know, we go, we really encourage them to keep writing. And by the end of the year, you know, pointing out that they're really doing well and writing the whole time. Um, it's good to encourage and um, compliment them on that. And uh, we also uh, encourage them with saying how they focused and the success of the class that day. And students might also reflect on the work that they've done. So it's not just teacher praise. It could also be, you know, peer to peer and um, individual reflection on how they felt they did on the writing process for the day. Okay, I think I am next for the writer's workshop assessment. I'm a fifth grade teacher at Rancho Vista. So um, in the beginning, we give the students a prompt as soon as we begin the new unit. Like in my class, we just finished a narrative. So um, tomorrow they will, and we had our celebration. So tomorrow they will hear a prompt to begin their informational writing. So they do the prompt and, you know, it, it's just very short, uh, you know, and it's the same prompt at the beginning of the unit and at the end. So we can see the growth. And then if we can flip to the next slide. Okay, so now that so now that we have assessed them to see where we are at the beginning, then we take them through all the steps that we just heard from the Dapple Gray teacher. And um, there's three a year. So we do the, um, the first one, the narrative, then we're doing informational, and then we'll do opinion. So when the students start the first, like this is one of my first drafts that a student did. And then this is the final after having taught the whole unit. And then we grade this. And this is really wonderful because when we show the students, look where you started and look where you got, they are super excited. And we are super excited to see all their growth. Um, as we go through, as soon as we begin, we then analyze their first draft or you know, they're, they're on demand and this guides you know, our teaching with them. So while we all kind of follow the same plan and all the same teaching points, we certainly then use this to conference with the students to know exactly what each student needs. Um, and then we just go through the whole process and then we use the rubric at the end. All right, I'm next. So our K-5 uh, steps. So uh, when we look at this, it's important to uh, note that this initiative is really here to stay. Um, while we do have this three-year plan, we did begin writer's workshop prior to this. Um, now we're just getting everyone started at the same level and just really refining our practice. Um, and this, these practices are very fluid um, and flexible and just responsive to our teachers and what's needed in the classroom at the time. So uh, year one, so that's this year, we're counting this year as year one because we're all starting uh, at the same level. So uh, in the classrooms, we do have a team that comes in and views lessons in the classroom in those three areas that we had discussed earlier. Uh, there's also that vertical articulation with sixth through eighth grades. And then in our second and third year, uh, we'll really move away from outside training and just support our teachers from within the schools. Um, so increasing training on conferencing, um, any new teachers that come in, refining the practices of those uh, that have been doing well with the initiative. Um, and then we'll just bring consultants in as we need them. 
All right, so how do we help our writers at home? So uh, it's important to just show interest, I guess, with anything with children is uh, ask them about it. Ask them about what they're writing. In elementary school, they may just want to show you what they're writing, which is fantastic. Secondary, they may just want to tell you. Um, so read any of the writing pieces that they bring home uh, with an open mind. You can ask questions about it, uh, point out what you like about it. But the most important part is just to really stay positive with it and really support them with their writing. So that was fantastic. Thank you. That was a quick uh, overview of what K-5 Writers Workshop looks like. And we're going to segue into our 612. So Dr. Alice Lee is going to start with some information about the 612 writing initiative taking place. Great. Thank you, Dr. Wiley. And again, if you have any questions, please put it in the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom. Uh, and Becky, you want to start us off? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to be addressing the first four items on the top of the screen. And so it's really important for everyone to understand that we received our funding in January of 2022. So like just this past January. So we're not officially in our year two, although we're calling it our year two, we're kind of calling it 1.5. Um, but what we decided to do last year is identify teacher leaders, all of whom are in this meeting. So that's why they're here because they are our instructional writing leads and coaches. Um, we took the time to research various district writing programs. We met with outside consultants, higher ed professors, all of which really led us to the plans for this year that we're in right now. So we have the right people in the room, in the right place to make the right moves. And we feel very, very confident about that. So in this 1.5 year of implementation, we're continuing to carve out time for um, dedicated protected meetings for our teachers, where they're not gonna be talking or discussing other, other things besides writing. Um, for example, our 6-8 teachers met in June to create the narrative common rubric and prompt, and then all of the 6-12 teachers met in August to complete the same task. And this year, we've already car carved out a handful of days for our 6-8 teachers and our 9-12 teachers. It's really also important to know that English is the largest department in 6-12. We're big. And we have a lot of teachers that teach multiple levels in terms of grades and classes. It's a big shift, but one that we're ready for. And since so, so many of our teachers are already doing this great work, and now we just have a space that we can come together and we can share and we can collaborate, we can discuss and model really the best practices that so many of us are already doing. Dr. Lee. All right. And so with our intermediate and high school teachers, we will be going through the process of calibrating students writing using these rubrics to ensure that there's consistency across the schools and with teachers. So what my two or three on a rubric would, uh, it would mirror, let's say Miss Adela's uh, three on a rubric on a piece of writing. Um, we will also be looking at data from student results so that it will guide our writing teams with next steps of honing in our instruction around teaching points and areas for focus for student success. And lastly, we are working to bridge writing theory and all the things that we know that make up good, coherent writing with providing students the opportunities to practice their skills in meaningful ways. Next slide. So um, in English, we have four different modes of writing. Um, at the middle school level, we focus on one mode of writing per trimester, and we integrate research throughout um, the entire school year in smaller um, research projects and um, adding research to other writing assignments and projects and things like that in class. So um, our first trimester at the middle school level starts with uh, narrative writing. Um, then we'll move to informative writing and we'll finish with argumentative writing. Um, we like to start with narrative writing because it's a little bit easier for students to jump into with a little bit more creativity um, and a loose structure. And that allows us to teach the elements of narrative writing while we're also teaching um, smaller, um, writing pieces that will build to our full informative um, and explanatory writing. Um, and it's really important to keep in mind, um, it's an older school of thought when we talk about 
um, writing several five paragraph essays and just constantly writing these really lengthy essays over and over and over. Um, and we've learned over time that it's more effective when we get better results from students if we can break things down in pieces and teach those skills in chunks. Um, and develop those over time um, and work toward a longer piece that um, is ultimately better quality. So um, that's kind of the philosophy between, behind all of these. And they are all supported with mentor texts as well in the classroom with samples um, and various examples of what that kind of writing would look like and um, what we're looking for. Um, and to add to what Rachel just said, um, so we are doing pieces of writing, may it not be five paragraph essay, all throughout since the beginning of the school year. Um, one of the things that we really focused on creating, and this was er, uh, end of last year and continued focusing on it early this year, was to have shared academic language. So that if we do use acronyms in the classroom, um, if we do use certain essay vocabulary words, that it's a common language amongst all the teachers um, in the middle school and um, across, the, uh, sorry, across the grade levels. So if I were to say something like, okay, well, make sure you answer, you know, that short response in CER, the kids know like, oh yeah, I need to make a claim. I need to include evidence. And then I need to um, have an explanation or give reasoning. Um, so that it has been really our main focus to start with because these short answer responses later build in to more of the paragraphs, and then those paragraphs become multiple paragraphs and then a full essay. Uh, the other part was we got together, we talked about, okay, so what are the parts of an essay that we talk about? What do you include in an essay? So kind of just to break it down to see, are we all on the same page? We want to make sure that we're giving the same message. Um, and then we also came up with some of the, I guess, so to say, the academic um, thinking or higher levels of thinking, the words that we use, like define, hypothesize, compose, compose, sorry. What are some of those synonyms that we can also use? And these are made into posters that are posted in the classrooms of all the language arts teachers across the three middle schools. Um, maybe some parents saw it at back to school night, hopefully. Um, and this is something that, you know, I, I went over with my classes too, to just kind of show them like, hey, these are the things you see these posters, we're using them, we'll keep revisiting them. And you'll also hear the language, you know, some of the ACE, RACE, RATE, CER, you'll hear them hopefully in your other grade levels too, as you know, you go on. Um, also, the hope is to have this common language translate over into the other subject areas as well, so that when we do focus on the cross curricular writing, that the kids have something to kind of be like, oh yeah, I learned that in language arts. Oh, cool, it applies to this subject too. So that was kind of our one of our starting grounds with let's work on common language across our department. So um, one of the things we talked about was rubrics and how are we assessing students and how do we know that from teacher to teacher, um, from grade level to grade level, that we are um, looking for the same things and evaluating in the same way. Um, and what um, teachers got together and um, realized or decided was we look to um, obviously the state of California to tell us what are our goals, what is it they expect from us. And they put together um, rubrics for each type of writing that are used on the state test. Um, and those rubrics aren't specific to the test. They are rubrics that the state of California expects students at that grade level to be able to achieve. And so we decided to use that as a foundation for what we came up with. Um, because what we also realized is giving students rubrics in at least the middle school level that have big chunks of paragraphs explaining what 
um, is expected of them is not really helpful. Students read that and they don't really understand what they're expected to do and, and to demonstrate. Um, so we took those rubrics and we broke them into bullet points that are easier for students to digest and they understand more clearly what's expected of them at every level in every category. So this is a, a rubric that is used for narrative writing. It's broken into the five strands of narrative focus, organization, elaboration of narrative, language and vocabulary and conventions. So those are the five things that we teach throughout the trimester um, and have practice at using. And now they're putting together for a larger narrative assignment where they're using all of those skills in all of one writing piece. Um, and you can see the um, requirements from a level four paper versus a three, a two, a one, and a zero. Um, mostly the verbs are what's changing. So they're effectively establishing a setting, for example, um, in narrative focus versus a three would be adequately establishing a setting. A, a two would be partially establishing a setting. A one is not doing that, right? Um, and so um, we talk about what that looks like. We compare that to, again, model text in our classroom, sample papers, um, and we're able to see um, what the students are able to see what they're expected to achieve and to work toward. And this is something that they refer to before they're starting an assignment, while they're working on the assignment, and then before they finish, they review that again. Um, and then for revisions, this is the foundation of where do I need to improve? improve what should I be doing next? Um, and it's always based on this. It's really easy to just highlight a bullet point of like, this is what needs to improve. Um, and then jot down a comment on the student's paper that relates to that on how they can improve or find an example. Um, and so a rubric like this makes it much clearer for the middle school level students um, to see what, what we're hoping they can achieve at the end of the trimester. I want to go ahead and talk about kind of building off what Rachel just spoke about. I'm Sandra Sadella. I teach at Peninsula High School, but I'm going to talk about the work we've not begun, I guess I'll say. We just completed this in August. So for the high schools, this is fairly new. While we've been using rubrics for obviously many, many years, we've collaborated on what will be our rubric for explanatory writing for semester one. So ninth through 12th grade, this semester, all students will be writing an explanatory essay. The prompts are going to differ, obviously, for the grade levels, and they're also going to differ based on the type of course. And I think that's really important for parents to hear because writing is so unique. When I have a student who is in a collab course, their needs are different than my students in my AP literature courses. And that doesn't mean that, sh that we're not challenging them. It just means we understand we want to create success and we want to build and scaffold upon the needs and the skills that are currently there. So the rubric that we created um, from both high schools who collaborated on this was kind of a mix of a number of rubrics that we're held accountable to. The reason we didn't just use CAS is we spoke about CAS structure and that rubric kind of has a pass fail system. We felt that in the classroom, that's not how we wanted to function with two columns passing and the rest kind of not quite passing. So if you look at our rubric, it runs like an A, B, C, D, F system, which students and families and teachers know very well. So just like middle school, you'll see that we have five major areas of focus. They're very similar, organization, evidence or supporting details, uh, commentary or your analysis, what you're saying about that evidence, which is very important conventions and formatting, and then at the high school level, which I think I saw too with middle school is that voice and style. Um, what we also do, because the rubric's the same, when they're in the younger grades, we may say, all right, this time the grade is gonna be heavily upon the first three. And then I'll be marking you know, that voice and style, but you know, I know you're young and still developing it, it may not quite apply to your grade as heavily as it would a junior and senior. So families should also know we understand that that grows with time and age, certain elements. But just like the middle school, we have words and, and terms that change as you go down the columns. 
So I went ahead and I highlighted it on organization. You can see it, if it's a four, it's clear and it's exceptional. And we make sure students see examples of that. Students often get time to take their writing and rework it. We don't just rush through essays. And I know that was Sutter ID, but I think we really need to reiterate that tonight because that was such an old school way of thinking. You know, it's more like a sport. You, you really take those skills and foundations and you practice them and you practice them. And maybe this time you do it in a verbal way. Maybe this time you do it in a, you know, there's so many different ways we do it in a reverse outlining. Whatever it is, we make sure that they're working on it in a, a number of um, angles so that they're catching on how to do a thesis or they're understanding how to throw in syntactical elements, not just saying, well, do another essay. It wasn't so good last time. So we do scaffold quite a bit on the skills themselves and the rubric scaffold too. So you can see it's clear and exceptional on a four, it's just clear on a three and it goes down adequate developing on a one and inadequate and obstructing meaning on a zero. And all the different um, focuses sort of have that higher up to a lower concept. And again, we use not just CAS to guide us, we also used, many of us have AP classes and we looked at those rubrics. We also looked at, um, we did acquire rubrics from some of the colleges, which I'll talk to you about on our next slide. We've been scaffolding upward and doing some collaboration and some connections with a few local colleges as well to make sure we really are making our students ready for that next level. And again, I'll talk to that a little more. Um, so it's a pretty exciting rubric because some people may look at this and say, wow, that's really vague. And I'm sure the middle school may talk to this too. That was done on purpose so that I could take it for my AP literature course and adjust and write my comments on it, but it could also work toward any level. And the students understand in our classroom what that four means. We make that very clear. We make it very clear what a two looks like. They are never surprised by that. We do a lot of work leading up to when this full analysis comes in. And then in second semester, we'll be developing a same rubric and those skills toward an argumentative piece in all the English classrooms, nine to 12 on both campuses. Um, and I think that leads us into our next slide Olivia and I are going to speak a little bit about what happens next. Um, and that's talking about plans for year three, year four. Please keep in mind for the high schools and middle schools, it's like year 1.75, year two. We're, and I know we're all kind of at different stages, but we are moving forward. Um, one thing I just alluded to that we're very excited about the high school, uh, Cal State Los Angeles and UCLA's Director of Composition and Director of Undergraduate the Writing Center, um, they have been in connection. We've reached out and we've done the legwork to get resources from both of their professors who run those programs. And they've been so accommodating and taught us so many wonderful things. I do wanna say, and I, I wanna make it public, so much of the knowledge that was shared, our, our teachers at all the levels are already doing that colleges expect. And that's fantastic. And I can't wait to share that with so many of our staff. And, um, and they had some other things that they do. Uh, they do, they go a lot slower. You know, they, one of the professors was talking about taking 16 weeks for a paper. Now we can't do that because our papers are about 20, 30 pages. But when we talk about slowing down, we're doing the right thing. And so we're making those connections and getting resources and, and we're gonna connect with more colleges because I know our students go to a variety. We're gonna look at some community colleges and slowly build those connections. Um, we're obviously gonna not just scaffold upward but continue to scaffold across our district and make connections meeting with middle school and high school and I'm sure middle school down to elementary school. So we're making sure the kids as they grow the program is continuing to grow with them and their needs. Um, the development that we're doing, this is the first time in a while we've really had our own teachers be able to get together and focus. Part of that is the past few years, we've had other things to focus on, as we all know. Um, but the devotion to this, I think, is so important for students. And we're really get bang, being given the time and the resources to make sure that we can continue this good work. Olivia, did you want to talk about um, some of the other items ahead for next year? 
Um, yeah, so for the middle school, again, we're in year one point, whatever, five, two, five, who knows, three, five. Um, and so one of the things we have coming up um, this year that we hope to continue doing next year is we've kind of come up with it's not necessarily the exact same prompt for all the teachers, but almost kind of like a skeleton. So we have different dates where in the middle school, it'll be sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, all three middle schools, teachers who teach that grade level will meet together and we'll kind of talk about our grading process. So that would be the calibration part. Um, also at the same time, we kind of want to start within our school setting. So for example, let's say for argumentative for sixth grade, Usually sixth graders do not have to learn how to write a counter argument paragraph, but it is a seventh grade standard. So in that sense, we want to make sure that we're linking, you know, and teaching and doing the same thing throughout in our schools and within our middle schools. And then at the same time, you know, we have representatives like Ms. Adela's from Penn High, uh, Ms. Lewis is from TV high where we have meetings where we'll talk about, hey, what are you guys seeing at the high school that we can better do at the middle school? And same with elementary schools too, you know, hopefully we will be able to kind of see like, hey, is there any way, like, are you teaching this? Is there any way we can strengthen this? And again, this is all still a work in process. Um, and I think as Sandy mentioned, one of the biggest things that I would like to emphasize, I think as well as you know, the rest of my colleagues is that we're going for the process, not really, you know, pr the product. So in other words, qualitative versus quantitative. We want to make sure that the students know how to write solid paragraphs before we, you know, are like, okay, you're going to write an essay, you're going to write an essay, here's another essay. Um, so we're really focusing on that process and making sure that we are aligned as colleagues with what our final goal is and what our common goal is. And then eventually, you know, we would like to kind of branch out and support the other subject areas to do writing across the curriculum more and hopefully help them to feel more comfortable with parts they may not feel comfortable about, you know, stick me in a math classroom and tell me to do something and be like, I don't, not comfortable. I would like some, you know, maybe the support of a math teacher. So that would really be the next kind of some steps we would like to take next year to support other subjects into incorporating more writing into their curriculum as well. So it's a joint group effort and, you know, it's a big undertaking, but we're all very excited and eager to, I guess, spread the, so to say, love of writing. I think one thing I should have mentioned a little bit more, and I think, Olivia, you touched on it a little bit. We are meeting as full departments, both schools, and sitting down with samples of our students writing, uh, anonymous samples, but then looking at in same grade levels, you know, what are we seeing? What needs do we have? What great techniques could help each other? And I, I think that collaboration is excellent for the classroom. It helps all of us grow. I mean, I think you, one of the best learning tools is learning from each other. And we have that in place already this coming January. It also helps us build, okay, then what comes next? You know, how do we adjust the rubric? What are we noticing across the board our students seem to need, not just isolated in my classroom? And so um, we're gonna continue to meet and look at that data, look at those results, and then create next steps and next goals to put into action from there. So um, I think that folds us into year four. And looking at year four, a lot of that is continuing on with those same concepts and goals and helping them grow. Continuing that articulation is so important. You know, even learning what we can do at the upper levels to support the lower levels, even though we get them last, we want to make sure that we continue this common language, you know, to have the kids come up and just say, well, I'm going to call it something else. I mean, those poor kids are going to be like, what do you mean? There's no ACE anymore. You know, and we need to make sure that we're also working on how could we support the great work happening there? And it's exciting to see something from K to 12. Uh, professional development, having that continue, we're already reaching out and hoping that maybe we can bring in these actual composition professors or someone who is in the field doing this, who can then give us that view of beyond us, you know, what do they see? What can we learn? 
Um, continuing, we have uh, Leah Lewis and myself. We are the writing coaches at the high school level and at intermediate, we have writing leads. So continuing that because we obviously have large departments and helping our teachers and continuing the collaboration. And then like Olivia just said, you know, high schools are huge and so are middle schools. And having that cross-curricular, when you're talking about over, you know, a thousand, two thousand students and a hundred plus faculty, it's gonna take time to really build writing across the different curriculums. And so we'll need time, it's gonna take a few years to train people, to help them, to give them resources, have them meet. Um, we've had those tricks for a long time, so we want to continue working with that. Um, and Alice, I didn't know if you wanted to speak to your four or if Leah wanted to pop in on that, but ah, I'd love that. Yes. Yeah, I think we will us, you know, I've said a lot, <laughs> but I think we just, you know, want to keep that always looking forward and what's our sequence next and where do we want to keep scaffolding um, in the future? Sure, Ms. Lewis, do you want to jump in? Yes, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I teach at Palos Rees High School. As far as with what both Sandy and Olivia have stated in regards to grades six through 12 thus far, it's important to know that this is a continuous process. And even after year four, we're gonna continue. And as far as with looking at the scope and sequence, this is something as far as with going back and looking at vertical articulation, um, because that's important to know that this is something that we have to know what our fellow feeder schools are doing. And as far as with having and sharing that common knowledge and that common foundation. And as far as with looking at professional development and consultations, with looking with other people within the community, whether it's colleges or universities, or maybe it's just even within our own departments. We have a lot of years built within our English department individuals. Um, so just having those, you know, courageous conversations that sometimes, you know, that one person, that one colleague within the department might have something, that one little trick up their sleeve to help everyone else um, is huge and saves, you know, not only a lot of time for maybe that teacher that's struggling or that brand new teacher, but also, you know, that golden nugget of opportunity of sharing a shared growth. Um, but looking as far as with cross-curricular connections, that's huge. Um, as far as with in every single subject, students write. And we need to, you know, have that solid foundation as far as with that terminology within the elementary, the intermediate, and the high school. So students know what their expectations are. And those rubrics then start to look crystal clear. Um, because once they start seeing that rubric from you know, intermediate school and they've got it and they know exactly what those expectations, those expectations are not gonna change from year to year. Um, so it's really important as far as with also looking at research that English can support those other subjects, especially within the format of Modern Language Association, because that is a humanities driven as far as with uh, utilizing as far as with note taking, as far as with citing sources within papers. And we can also help those other disciplines that as far as with American Psychological Association, APA writing within the sciences and the math departments. So that's something that students, especially within, you'll see that when Sandy spoke about the explanatory rubric, that that rubric actually tags on with the MLA or APA format. So those, you know, subjects, those other subjects could, you know, maybe start grasping onto these rubrics as well. And it's something that we will continue to do. And as far as with having, you know, us as coaches, it's important to realize that we are going to have, you know, new teachers um, coming to PVPUSD or also teachers that teach other subjects, or maybe they haven't taught, you know, maybe a specific, or specific grade level. For example, myself, I haven't taught freshmen since 2005, and I have a freshman class again this year. So it's something that we have to be cognizant of, we have to be on board and be able to be equipped to help our follow colleagues so then our students will be able to improve. All right. Well, thank you all so much. I just want to, again, just reiterate um, what we've all kind of been saying, but um, I hope you are able to see that really from kindergarten, actually even pre-K, TK, our transitional kindergarten, all the way to 12th grade, our goal is to create uh, lifelong communicators who are effective in their, not only their verbal speech, but also in the written communication. So thank you again. Um, I will look at some of the questions and, and we have about 10 minutes that we can answer. So any teacher, um, Maybe Dr. Wiley, we can we can turn off the 
the slide deck and then we can see all our faces. <laughs> um, so one of the questions that was asked was, what are some of the areas of concern with writing? Um, there are so many pieces to comprehensive writing. So we have data. So do we have data? What, what have you been seeing in terms of data? Where um, are there specific areas in writing that you, you're seeing and noticing? I, I can answer that a little bit. Um, on the middle school level, um, that actually is what have, has driven our progress so far. Um, we started by looking at what the deficits were and what problems we were seeing um, with students in our classes. And um, that is what started with our posters. <laughs> um, and so looking at, you know, in my class, when we're talking about answering short answers, I refer to them as ACE responses, um, answer the question, cite some evidence and explain that evidence. But in another class, they might be using RATE, which is the acronym. It means the same thing, right? But um, the, the acronym stands for something different. Um, and so students were coming in unsure that they knew what a short answer response was. Um, and so we have decided to make sure that we're using all of those acronyms and all of that terminology in our classes so that they are familiar with like, oh, when they say this, this is what it means. Um, because we were giving prompts and instructions and some students seemed completely lost. Um, and then the second issue that we um, are addressing still, obviously posters are just the beginning, but it's how we're teaching them and using them in our classroom. But that academic language, um, if we are asking students to critique something, um, a lot of times that word critique will hold them up and they, they're familiar with the word, but they're not familiar with what that's asking them to do in a writing, in a written response. Um, and so, um, providing synonyms that mean the same thing and talking about replacing them with things that they're more familiar with and then going back and identifying um, in the prompt now what should I do with that um, has already been very very helpful um, and so it was really just that academic language and I know as a teacher I become very familiar or just I get in the habit of writing prompts that use the same terminology um, and then they move on to another teacher that's using different terminology and it's like they've never done it before. Um, and so um, they do, they have the skills once we realize that they're realizing, oh, I do know this, I can, I can do that. Um, and so that was something we, I, right away across the board when we met with all of our teachers, everybody was saying the same thing. Um, and so we're already addressing that again, it's just the beginning, but it's how we are teaching that in our classroom and uh, uh, using those things and referencing them and interchanging our vocabulary as we work. Um, and so for the, at the middle school level, that's what we were seeing. Um, just that academic vocabulary is really essential. I could speak and quickly also to, to the add, high school. Quick, Olivia, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, and to add um, to what Rachel said is, um, so I teach seventh grade at PDIS. Um, and this might kind of answer Jennifer uh, Hangen's question from earlier too, is um, there's certain things that I would think, oh yeah, you guys should be able to write in full complete sentences. But then just kind of seeing short answer responses, that wasn't really something that was going on with a lot of the students to start with. So literally even just going back and being like, what is a full complete sentence? Okay, you need to put your question in your response. You need to do that for all of all of your short answers. You should be doing that. As I always say, I'm like, you should be doing that in all of your subject areas, social studies, science, um, and just kind of showing them this is what it should sound like, you know, um, and just kind of going back. And I know that's basic, but it's kind of important to even mention that at the beginning. No, you can't start your sentence with because or my favorite, C-U-Z. Um, and um, I know this is a, uh, Gen Z is very text savvy. So that's something we also see influencing the writing with the capitalization, the not capitalizing the I's. So it, it may be a norm to, so to say, Gen Z, but to, eat, to bring that to attention and be like, what I always say, my phrase, it's not cute to not capitalize your I. So bringing attention and awareness to that is also a big part of it. And really just for me, I've been like hammering hard on it at the beginning of the year because I want that to be fixed, so to say, or at least a thought that, you know, the students have when they write. Ms. Adela, did you have something that you wanted to add about what are some of the areas of concern? Um, I was going to say the question they did. I know they um, it was posted about data 
when we look at the data, our students I can speak to the high school level. Both high schools, CAS scores went up. The AP scores, the writing components were amazing. So if we look at that, it looks like, well, why are we doing all this? But those are small glimpses, just in the sense that CAS will only test 11th grade. And we do have a lot of our students who do AP, but that's one test at the end of the year. What we wanted was to make sure that we're helping all students. We're not waiting till 11th grade. You know, we're making sure that we have something that's growing through the years. And it's more than just data. I mean, I think to us, as a, I don't want to speak for everyone here, but as an English teacher, I, I mean, it's a skill. It's a life skill of communication. I, I know everyone talks about data, but for me, I want to make them communicators for life. And I'm sure so many people on this panel do too. And so that skill deserves every bit of resource we're giving here. And that is fall is is that no matter how much they might test at the end of the year in these big ways uh, and do well, it takes a long time in the year to get them back to there sometimes. And we're trying to make a program where it'll be so great when I get them from junior year and I look and I go, I know for the past three years you have done this and now we're gonna move on. Rather than saying, well, I standards tell me you're supposed to do this. I'm really hoping it happened. We all can rely that this, I know I keep saying scaffolding, but this, this ladder is truly happening and our kids can really rely on it too. And I think that's where this came in. I don't think it's a, I mean, I don't want to speak um, for district, but I don't believe it's that there's a gap and data was alarming and we had worries because they're doing great as far as those scores. But we do see a need where we can still be better as a program and we still see communicators that need more guidance and we can create something that's even stronger. Okay, I'm gonna to try to merge two questions into one. We have four minutes. So the first one is how can parents help um, scaffold their children's writing at home? Um, can the rubrics be shared with families so that they, they see what the goal is and what, um, what the end result should look like? And um, in terms of just streamlining in uh, instructional vocabulary, what are, what are some of the tips and strategies we can share with our families? I'll, let me just talk real quick about elementary and then middle and high can probably hop in on this one with some of the beefier rubrics and such. You know, in elementary, we just want them to be like content in their writing. If they, we, if we don't want to stress little people out where they're going to hop in and just like you're saying, Sandra, that scaffold is exactly what we want to do. We want to scaffold every year. We want to kind of increase the rigor every year as they're moving through. Um, and so that that calm affect in like, OK, we're going to write. They should be like, all right, we want to write. And that's what we're starting to see a lot more. We were always doing writing. We haven't ever abandoned writing. Um, even in some of our COVID years, we're, the kids were still producing some really great things. It was just amazing. And that's because we have great parent support, very purposeful and, and being at school in Palos Verdes and everyone's kind of all working together. So I think it's been very collaborative over the years, but the elementary schools are 10, right? Where it's 10 of us. So we were all doing um, sort of different programs, some similar, some, but we were all writing. We were all doing it. We wanted to kind of get on the same page and be able to have some common language so we can do common training. So the kids have some, some common expectations to build. So I think parents at home in elementary, be excited. Don't be critical. Don't bring a red pen out. You're not going to see a lot of red pins on our paper. Um, so just be excited and celebrate their writing successes, small and large, make them all matter. Um, and just have fun with writing and keep it in a really relaxed uh, context because we'll, we'll dig in deep at school. So what you see at home, just celebrate and have a good time with them and, and encourage, encourage in a positive way. I think asking about where the rubrics, I'm, I'm I see a head of head nodding. I mean, I'm sure, yeah, we always share rubrics with the kids for sure. So I, everyone has their different platforms. I don't, I don't want to speak for everyone right now, but I mean, my students have already seen the rubric. I'm sure many of your students have already seen the rubric. So um, we'll, we'll figure out where that platform can be. And um, Dr. Lee and, and, Miss Egan, I uh, will figure that out, right? But um, yeah, the kids already have seen many of them. And if they haven't, they're going to see it by fall break. At least I know at the high schools because we're doing the essay. But absolutely, the, the rubrics out there and we'll, we'll kind of, uh, what 
figure, I don't know, Dr. Lee, do you want to jump in on that one? <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think the teachers are sharing the rubrics out to their students. So, you know, what we're hoping to do is that before the students or as the students receive like their writing prompt, they're also getting the rubric at the very beginning. So there's no surprise. Like we're not trying to do a gotcha to the kids. The kids, our students should have success measures very at the very beginning. And so that they are working towards that. And um, teachers, I hope that, that these rubrics are able to also go home so that when families are not helping or writing the essays with their for their kids or writing, you know, but um, they can support them at on the home front. I hope that answered that question. Well, I, I apologize. They're on Otis, which is in the portal. So once once they're graded, parents will be able to see that um, on Otis, which we can talk about how to let parents know that, um, that may not be accessible yet, but the, they'll definitely be there, at least for the high school. I, I, I don't know what other programs yeah. are using, and I, um, but there'll be a I way to see it. say we talked, um, in addition, they, I mean, they're always, rubrics are always distributed as a new writing prompt is is being distributed um, across the schools. I can say that's pretty standard practice. Um, and they take them home and then review them again throughout the writing process. That's it's not like overnight we're writing something quick, right? Um, so throughout the writing process and then at the end, um, and then we discussed um, posting them somewhere. So we're still in progress um, as we keep reminding everybody um, as we continue to um, solidify these rubrics and make sure that teachers across the three middle schools and then the, the teachers at both high schools are happy with um, these foundational rubrics that those can be posted somewhere that um, they're easy to access and see by everybody. Can, can I jump in with an idea? Is that okay? Um, um, I always tell my students November is National Novel Writing Month. They were talking about extra opportunities and PVLD is doing a bunch of um, different um, activities and events for, they're calling it um, RIMO month. And if you go on the PVLD website, the PV Library District, there's all kinds of things happening at the end of October and the beginning of November. They're having a writing contest every month. So those are really, that's a, a, in November, there are all of these writing opportunities, usually October and November. So that's one thing that um, I've had a lot of kids in sixth grade this year who've written novels in the past. They've written them um, or written long stories, like 90 page stories. Um, and I am seeing like the elementary had said um, that joy of writing coming through. And it's funny because a lot of them said they did it during the lockdown, um, their long stories. Um, so they did, some of them took that as an opportunity to do long pieces of writing. So there are, there's that opportunity. And I always tell parents, there's a book by Ralph Fletcher called A Writer's Notebook. And that's a good thing to, to get kids started on a writer's notebook because they just are collecting ideas for writing. So those are just a couple of fun ideas. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, again, thank you everyone so for joining. Oh, do you have one, one more last comment? Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, I was just going to say to also encourage reading of various genres because usually your voracious readers are also the ones that are, you know, pretty good writers too. And uh, not, you know, to read different genres as well as magazines or anything like that because newspapers, anything, because the style of writing is different from just books. So just reading really anything and everything and encouraging that does also kind of contribute to the writing as well. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, and we hope you have a wonderful Thursday. And I, we hope that this webinar um, answered any questions or curiosities you might have had with our district's writing program. Thank you.